when you try to convey simply to people what antimatter is, it's it's very tempting to reach for metaphors, isn't it? And I I liked in the book your expression yin and yang to describe the relationship between matter and antimatter. That seemed to me to to capture this mirror relationship. Can you expand on that a little bit? I also got Tweedledum and Tweedledee. I mean, the most mundane one, I think, was the idea of a child building a sandcastle on the sand. You know, after the tide has gone out, you've got a beautifully hard-packed, flat sand, and a child digs a hole and makes a sandcastle. So the sandcastle is the analogy for matter, and the hole that is left behind is antimatter. The question then, of course, is, but quite how does matter and antimatter really relate to each other? If you were made of antimatter and I met you out in space somewhere, just looking at you, you would look exactly the same to my eyes as you would if you, as if you're made of matter. From the outside, antimatter and matter look just the same. Dig deeper and deeper into matter or antimatter and they continue to look the same right down to the level of atoms. It's not until you get inside the atoms that you suddenly see this very profound duality that whereas our atoms have got little negatively charged electrons whirling around a positive nucleus, the anti-atoms have positively charged positrons whirling around a negatively charged anti-nucleus. So the electricity is all back to front, but everything else is the same, because all that the rules of electricity care about, as we all learn in school, Opposite charges attract, like charges repel. It doesn't care whether the opposite is plus with minus or minus with plus, it's perfectly symmetric. And so the rules of attraction and repulsion that would build up antimatter in bulk are the very same ones that build up matter in bulk. So it's only when you get deep inside the atoms you start seeing this duality to nature. And as you say, it, it's not evident to the naked eye if I were composed of antimatter. Um, and you, you've got a very nice thought experiment in the book where you talk about a spacecraft with humans sort of in orbit around a planet and, and there's intelligent life on the planet. But how do you decide if the planet is composed of antimatter and therefore is, you know, you're going to explode on impact? And can, can you talk through that a little bit? What we're trying to do is to decide whether the anti-alien is made of the same stuff as us, in which case we can shake hands or not. Well, first of all, why do I care? Because if they are made of anti-stuff, if I shake hands with them, then our hands will mutually annihilate each other and probably the rest of us as well. So it's a matter of, uh, this is the ultimate uh, weapon of mass destruction. Mass destruction, that's a good pun because all of our mass will be destroyed and turned into energy. So we want to know, are they made of the same stuff or the opposite? The simple thing would be to say, are the atoms that you're made of, the little particles whirling around on the outside, are they negatively charged or positively charged? Are they electrons or positrons? Well, that question has no meaning. I mean, we're assuming the alien speaks English, but unless they've got a dictionary, I mean, how do I know that what they call positive is the same as I call positive? So I've got to find some other way of getting at it. It turns out that there is one place, in fact, now two places, but one place historically where a subtle difference between matter and antimatter has been found. It's in an arcane, strange particle whose mass is about halfway between the electron and the proton, the constituents of our atom. So it is possible to go through a series of logical steps to the alien. Because what I want to do, I want to find out if I can define this strange particle, so the alien and I both know we're talking about the same thing, I can then ask when this particle decays, does it produce the little thing that I call the electron, the thing that is on the outside of the atom, more often or less often? And depending on which it is, I can determine whether his electron is the same as mine or opposite to mine. So all I've got to do now is to define to the alien what this strange particle is. And I'll say, you are uh, an advanced alien, so the simplest atom in your universe has got a lightweight particle on the outside and a heavy particle in the middle. That we all agree with. And I'm now interested in not those two, but another particle that you will have met, which is almost halfway between them. And when it decays, it decays in a lopsided way. And once we've done that, we can then proceed and have the argument. And if 
two things happen. One, if the alien responds that the way it goes in his universe is the same as it did in mine, we can shake hands because we're safe, so long as I've got the logic right. There is another way you can actually do it. Somebody, when I was, you know, you write a book and you send it to people to make sure you haven't overlooked something. And one of them came back with the obvious thing is, rather than doing all that, why don't you just drop a little lump of rock into the atmosphere to see if it blows up or not? Like Tunguska, for example. Yes. Was that an anti-alien <laughs> testing, whether we are made the same stuff as it and then decided it was safer to go away? And I thought, yes, I suppose one could, but if it were really the case that there were intelligent aliens down there with the sort of weaponry that we have that suddenly discovered a spaceship suddenly did this act in the outer atmosphere what happens next you know that might be the theme of my science fiction novel but it wouldn't be a very wise way to go about it antimatter has been incredibly seductive for creators of science fiction and one of the interesting things that i picked out of your book was almost the the, the influence of the science fiction back onto reality tell me a little bit about how how that worked with the us military right well i suppose the most famous example in science fiction that people know of is star trek and the idea that in the Star Trek Enterprise, antimatter is the fuel. I suppose for a moment we should say, why, why do we care about it? The point is that all energy is produced by E equals MC squared at work. But the most that we can get out, even in a, a nuclear weapon or an atomic, a nuclear power station, is less than 1% of everything that's locked into it. In the case of antimatter, you can remove 100%. So if you could use antimatter, that would be the most efficient spark ever. That is why the idea of antimatter is the perfect power source or the ultimate weapon of mass destruction fascinates. Now, the uh, Star Trek Enterprise is science fiction, but it is the case that NASA has and continues in some degree to look to the possibility that antimatter could be made in large enough amounts that you could use it as a means of powering a spacecraft. Although I don't think that that will ever be a reality, the possibility that you might be able to pick up antiparticles that are out there in space by some clever means and fuel a power source shouldn't be ruled out on its own. The other though more bizarre thing is the idea that you could make an antimatter bomb. I think probably I should just say straight away why you can't. The good news is that antimatter doesn't exist in bulk. There isn't a, a mine you can go and dig antimatter out of. If you could, then the possibility of having a just a, a, a milligram or less, a thousandth of a gram of antimatter would be enough to make a, a bomb comparable to what Hiroshima was like. Thankfully, you can't find that amount of antimatter. You have to make it an atom at a time. The amount of time it would take with present technology to make even a millionth of a gram of antimatter is 10 billion years, which is as long as the universe. And, you know, I'm not prepared to wait that long. Even assuming you could store it and keep it and retain it until you wanted to use it as a one-off. Now you can say, or oh, maybe we'll be more efficient at doing it someday. Well, we've got to be incredibly more efficient to bring 10 billion years down to any manageable time scale and you know the cost of it as well you can start estimating it is trillions of dollars which i think is ambitious even for the u.s military nonetheless the u.s air force allegedly have been interested in this well in fact i say allegedly this is actually a truism in 2004 some reporters from the san francisco examiner picked up on a story that a man called kenneth edwards who was giving a report at some meeting about the possibility that positrons, the simplest example of antiparticles, could be used as a means of creating miniature weapons of antimatter. And his talk, which almost defied belief according to reporters, had phrases in it uh, that you could make an antimatter bomb with the power of Hiroshima small enough to hold in one's hand, which is perhaps not the smartest thing to do, given what it would do to you, but let us continue on like this. You know, you can't make this stuff up. 